Good afternoon and welcome to CMC. From its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone. I'm Kristen Easterday, Director of Communications and Public Affairs at the Columbus Regional Airport Authority and I'm also a board member with CMC. So before we begin, I have a very few important thank yous. So first, I would like to thank today's forum sponsor, The Ohio State University, and thank you to the Columbus Dispatch for to supporting today's forum. And we would also like to thank the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream. So please help me thank all of those who supported today's forum sponsor. So to get to today's uh, forum. Founded in 1871, the Columbus Dispatch remains the only mainstream daily newspaper in Ohio's capital city. Newspaper leaders have witnessed enormous and dramatic changes over the past decades to how news in America is gathered, shared, and accessed by its readers. Today we will discuss the future of both Ohio's greatest home newspaper and jur journalism itself with a multi-generational panel. Please help me welcome today's distinguished speakers, including Edwina Blackwell-Clark, Executive Editor of the Columbus Dispatch, Amelia Robinson, Opinion and Community Engagement Editor of the Columbus Dispatch, and our two hosts, Nicole Kraft, Associate Professor with the Ohio State University School of Communication, and Jessica Langer, Editor-in-Chief of the Ohio State University's Lantern Media Group. I look forward to today's conversation. So do we. Oh, Jessica's gonna get us started. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I guess I just wanted to say thank you so much for speaking with us. We really appreciate it. Um, I kind of just wanted to start. Um, you know, you've welcomed a lot of young, diverse reporters at the Dispatch. What have they done to really change the Dispatch? What have they contributed and to the Dispatch and the community itself? I am having trouble hearing your question, so can you speak a little closer? Mike? Yeah, sure. So no problem. Sure. Yeah, um, I just want to start with, you know, um, you guys have welcomed a lot of young reporters to the Dispatch. What have they uh, what have they contributed to the Dispatch and the community? Well, first of all, um, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's critically important to have young talent, okay? Uh, we represent an entire community. Uh, we represent young, uh, middle class, uh, our middle age, and seniors. And so it's really great to welcome young talent and young reporters, um, young photographers in, into, the, um, into the newsroom, and for a couple reasons. First of all, they are probably a little bit more digitally savvy <laughs> than some of our old, you know, uh, my age uh, individuals. So that's that's useful. I mean, that that melding of young talent and and seasoned talent is great for a newsroom. The second reason is it's not really about young specifically, but it's about you've got to build an environment where people can express their opinions. Does it, it, it's one thing to bring them into a newsroom or anybody into a newsroom, but you've got to have structures and uh, ability for people to express those opinions. Because once again, uh, the newspaper is supposed to be representing everybody. So how do, we, how do we get those opinions? The third thing is it's an opportunity really for um, training and promotional opportunities promotional opportunities. So you've got to always have that continuing you know, stream of talent. Um, so th that's what I would say to that particular question. And you know, to add on to that a little bit, you also mentioned diversity. Obviously, Columbus is a lot of things, right? The census proved that the diversity, the, the, the market is growing because of diversity. So we need to reflect the entire community. That's why um, you know, Gannett, USA Today Network has had a, um, a big push to diversify our newsrooms because we want to really tell the stories of our actual communities and not just certain segments of the community. We want inclusivity in everything we do because um, that's important, not just to um, you know, reflecting uh, the people, but also the truth, right? We want to tell the truth of what the community actually is. I think that segues kind of perfectly into the question that Jess and I had um, regarding 
what you represent. So if we had been sitting up here a year or two ago, we would have seen two very different faces representing the Columbus Dispatch. And um, Columbia Journals and Review identified the Dispatch as being the whitest newspaper in America at one point. So what does the changing face of the Dispatch, how, how do you represent the changing face of the Dispatch and the representation in the Columbus community? Well, I, I think that, first of all, let me just say that um, to have a well-functioning um, business environment, there has to be opportunity for all, okay? There has to be opportunity for women leaders, there has to be opportunity for people of color leaders, there have to be opportunities for younger uh, leaders into an organization, because really that's, that's where you get the mix of are we representing the community, which is what Amelia just got done talking about. I am um, honored and thrilled to have this opportunity to lead the Columbus Dispatch. Yes, it may have been, you know, over 100 years, and it doesn't matter to me. You know, the, 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 what, what matters now is now, okay? What do we do now? How do we, how do I bring my unique perspective to driving news coverage? How does Amelia bring her unique perspective? How does any editor bring their unique perspective to make sure that we are looking at those stories uh, w that we are covering what women are doing, what we're covering what our, our minority communities are doing. Yesterday, I was at a naturalization ceremony. There were 150 immigrants who had made that decision uh, to be a U.S. citizen. When I was talking to the federal courts, they were like thousands, thousands of, of our citizens here, our, our, our residents here, are trying to be U.S. citizens here in the cent Central Ohio Columbus area. So we have a so we have a um, a reporter who's covering immigration. That's important. All, the, all that that community is growing. So when uh, in terms of what I represent and and what I um, are thinking as it relates to news coverage, we've got to represent, and we have to tell. I like uh, Amelia's uh, thinking. We got to tell the truth. What is their truth? What are the issues? Because historically, that's part of what newspapers do, which is if it's underserved community, shed light on the issues that are happening, celebrate the successes, talk about the issues that are going on in a community that the broader community needs to know about and needs to care about. So all of those things, specifics that I talked about, really fall into those key things that as a news organization, we did and we should have done 10, 20, 50 years ago, and we will do now and going forward. And, and to tell the truth, like there were opportunities years ago that people who look like me um, maybe wouldn't have gotten, not just in Columbus. I don't want to talk about Columbus because I don't know that to be true. But there's opportunities in newsrooms that, you know, people like me would not have gotten. So the fact is that organizations, not just in media, but across the board, are looking at ways to better include people who may have been excluded from the conversation before. And that's a very good thing. And these people are just as qualified as anyone else, but they may have been left out of those those uh, rooms before. So. Yeah, um, you guys spoke about how, what the role of media organizations are in society. And today, journalism isn't the same what it was years ago. It's constantly evolving. What do you think the role is of journalism today? Well, let me just say that I don't think journalism is uh, necessarily evolving. What I do think is the methods that we push that information out is evolving. What we do today is what we did 50 years ago in terms of a reflecting the community, public service journalism, um, talking about the issues that are impacting those that are under, um, that are, have less opportunity, um, keeping an eye on our, our elected officials and government <laughs> and make sure, keep them honest. Those things have not changed. Now, what has changed is that we are doing, we are pushing that content out in all different types of ways. People want to get their information all different kinds of ways. Let me, let me see a show of hands. How many people in the room have a, a smartphone? Yes. And we understand what we do with smartphones. We scroll. We get information. We almost use it as a little computer. Come on. So we, in every, every uh, mainstream media, organization that I know of is aggressively looking at how can we meet readers where they want to be met? 
We cannot. I'm, I'm a long-term newspaper reader. I, I grew up in a household where we had the newspaper all the time. I've, I've had over 25 years in the industry. So I, I love print. <laughs> I love that newspaper. But, but what I also love and know is that people want information all kinds. They want information when they want information. Okay, so what I'd like to tell people is the Columbus Dispatch is so much more than that printed paper. It is that, and it has been that for 150 years, and we will continue that strong, that strong journalism that you are used to. But you can get you can get information via audio podcasts. You can get information via um, video. You can get information via newsletters that are pushed to you. You can get information via e-blasts, breaking news alerts that are sent to you. That, this is something that, in terms of a change, that has happened in the, in the media industry, that we have figured out, oh, we've got to push information. We can't just rely on people to come to our site and just come um, and read our paper in the morning when it is delivered, because there's very few, if any, afternoon papers anymore. Some of you probably remember days when there was a morning paper and an afternoon. We don't have afternoon papers anymore. So we've, we have to be smart about how we, how we push that information out, and we have to be smart and innovative about how we deliver that information. Okay, so it's more than just words. It's graphics. We're integrating, we're integrating um, audio clips in stories, all that sort of thing. And we have app. We not, not only do we have the ColumbusDispatch.com, we've got dispatch apps. And so when you think about that, we're, we're trying to make sure that anybody who wants to consume our news can get it, get it when they want it, and in the format in which they want it. That is the change in terms of how we're pushing that information out. But in terms of the reporting standards, all the same, all the same. Yeah. Uh, speaking on innovation, is there anything that the dispatch um, has developed or will be developing to kind of fill that void of the print um, industry kind of going away as much? Um, you know, in terms of developing, um, once again, I, I would, if, if, you're, if you haven't been on dispatch.com or if you haven't seen our videos or, um, you know, uh, or seen our videos on social media, that, now that's another piece. That's another piece. I was, in the, I was in a discussion last week and they were, one of the panelists was saying that um, you shouldn't use social media to consume your information. We know, I think we know, and we can agree, that younger people use their news feeds as ways to get information. My perspective about that is we know they're there. We've got to put our information there. Okay, we, we've got to put the, the, the solid journalism that we're doing, we've got to push that out. So in terms of innovation and different things, you know, our conversation in the newsroom is how can we do a vertical reel? You know, how can we do a vertical video that we can use on Instagram? Well, we never had that conversation 10 years ago, <laughs> clearly. But we're, once again, we're having these different kinds of conversations about how we push that information out. And I will say too, we have a whole group, of, a whole table of journalists from the we dispatch, do. and um, you know, journalists. Let's give them all a round of yes. applause. Like, yes. They do the work every day. I'm not going to stop that. Uh, we have some innovative people. Uh, Sheridan, uh, one of our um, reporters, is uh, whiz on TikTok, and like we have some folks who are doing some great things on Instagram as well. We have Danae, who is doing some really awesome things with marginalized communities. It's just really a, a different way to look at how you tell stories and where you tell stories. Like when I said, it's not just one platform, it's the whole kit and caboodle, because we want to go where people are, because that's, it, it, we can't expect people to come to us, and we can't expect people to, you know, wait for news to end up on their front step, if that makes sense. Yeah. I guess one of the questions that we have, though, you, you actually still use the term newspaper, and I think a lot of us still use the term newspaper, but, the dispatch news that would come to my doorstep now is, is two days old when it's in print form. Um, when I looked for election results, I'll, I'll be frank with you, I didn't go to the dispatch. I went to uh, other sources that gave me the information more readily. Well, that was your mistake, because we were first. We were first to say we had, a, we oh, had a, everything right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah, anyway, so, go ahead. Dispatch.com so, had so it right first. Let me finish, let you finish your question. That'd be let great. Your question, <laughs> and then I'll respond. Um, would you consider the dispatch to be a daily? Product now? How do you how do you define 
kind of the news element of it and, and how and where it, we receive news and, and kind of going off what you mentioned about social media, social media is not gonna pay the bills, which is what we found when we all went onto social media and we all gave our news away. We put up websites for free, but that really compromised our ability to pay for news and, and I think the shrinking staff of the dispatch has evidence of that. So help us understand how we marry our expectation for news with the reality of what we're now receiving where we have to go out and seek it and it's not necessarily formulated in a package that's easy for us to consume. Well, I would say for everyone, uh, once again, I love print newspapers, but if you are just looking at the print newspaper and if you are just relying, as we had decades ago, but you're still just relying on the print newspaper for your breaking news and things like that, that was a great example in terms of um, uh, election coverage, then I would uh, respectfully suggest that you readjust, readjust what your expectations and what everything is. All of the breaking news coverage, that immediate coverage, all of that, it's online. It just is online. Because when you look at print deadlines, um, once again, this is, we're in a different environment than where we were before, okay? When we were before, we didn't go to press till midnight. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, so, uh, and people's expectations once again, I, I'm, I'm driving this from the, the viewpoint and the need of the audience. In the past, people's expectations were, I'll wait for the um, 6 o'clock, the 11 o'clock news, and, um, and the newspaper in the morning. So let's talk a little bit, let's talk a little bit about the other mediums. TV, uh, 4 o'clock news, sometimes 4, I'm in the morning, 5, 6, 6.30, um, then they're coming back at noon, 4 p.m., substations, 4 p.m., 4.30, 5 o'clock. They've added all of these times, once again, because they are reacting, as we are. We're reacting to when people need and want information. So, once again, I would respectfully, to answer your question, ask you to adjust your expectations. You want the breaking news, you want to hear about election results, you want to know about Ohio State, you want to, you want to know um, the commentary that our fabulous sports staff is doing about Ohio State and the Buckeyes, you gotta go online. Yeah, you have to go online. I need to it's add there. The, need it's add the there. blue jackets to that since Bailey Johnson's sitting right Okay, right. <laughs> All right. But it's there. It's there. It's just in a different, it, it's, it's there quicker it's just in a different place. Well, I do it's have to ask though, place. why should we buy the, why should we get the dispatch delivered then? So, you know, that's one of the, the things that I think we're struggling with when it comes to a print product. And I do yeah. actually, you know, in other cities, the, the print paper still sure. comes in a timely manner in sure. the sense that the news is not 48 hours old. And so I'm curious, what is the plan for the print version since the news is really not right. as timely as we need it to be? Right. I don't have any changes out to announce <laughs> as it relates to plan for the print version. Why should you get the print versions? First of all, all the stories that are in the newspaper are not online. If, if I'm not saying that everything in um, ABCD section is online, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the best stuff, I'm saying the most timely stuff, all those things are online. So all those other things are not online. Crosswords are not online. I'm just, I'm just on the feature section. Comics are not online. Uh, TV is not online. So everything is not online. That's the first thing. The second thing in terms of getting um, uh, the print product is from the advertising perspective, okay? Uh, the print vehicle, not just in Columbus, but everywhere, the print newspaper is still an extremely strong advertising vehicle for local advertisers. Okay, think, and, and think on Sunday, preprints, those sorts of things. I'm just, I'm just picking a day and I'm picking a specific scenario for advertisers. So, so that's why, that's, that's why you should continue to have a print newspaper because some of the things that you love may not be online and still, once again, it's a great venue for local advertisers. So great news. Yeah, um, in, ter in line with the idea of it being spread on social media, the things are coming out so quickly online. Um, oftentimes, journalism and social media posts can be conflated so much to the point where 
viewers don't really know the difference at this rate. How can um, media organizations and the dispatch kind of combat this issue? Yeah, I, you know what, I, I've um, said this a couple times, and um, the role of um, journalism is so critical today. You know, when you think of the last, I'll just say 10, 15 years, and the rise of partisan viewpoints, Okay, you've had the rise of Fox, the rise of CNN, the rise of MSNBC, not just all that. Then you've got partisan websites and pundits and all of that. Just, just think how much that has grown. Just think how much that has grown in the last 10, 15 years. There is 100% a need for, for journalism that is objective and well-reported. There, it, you cannot get away from that. You cannot be an informed citizen without that. So it, it does look like it's all mixed together. So what I would ask you to do is when you're looking at uh, content online, you need to ask, where's that coming from? You need to understand the source. You've got to understand the source. Because if it is a partisan view, of course you're going to get wh whatever side that you're on, you'll get that. If it is a, just a website, you know, um, curating content from other places and all that sort of thing, and that happens too, you know, you're gonna get that. But you've got to have the objective news information. And you're not, there's not many places in Central Ohio and in Columbus specifically that you will get the depth of information about certain things than the Columbus Dispatch. And when I say Columbus Dispatch, I'm talking about all of our platforms. Talk and really, like, when you think about it, like, I'm an, I work in the realm of opinion, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, what journalists do is not opinion. A lot of things you see on uh, Twitter and Facebook and all these, like, things are just something somebody's uncle said, right? Mm -hmm. You want somebody to be able to go out there and vet it to make sure it's act actually accurate and it is, is, is what it is. They say what a lie, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but a lie travels around the uh, social media world seven times faster than the truth. And this is what you know, we as citizens have to do is to put a stop to that, because we're the only people who can do it. It's not the journalist's responsibility. It's all of our responsibilities to really combat misinformation. And by doing that is to go to reliable sources who are trained professionals, who do have codes. We don't have like any rule books like it's some other professions, but we do have codes as journalists that we, are follow, we have to follow by, that we are taught in journalism school, and I know you're being taught right now, that we all go uh, and, and strive to do every day. Um, we wouldn't go into journalism if we didn't believe in truth, in the pursuit of truth. You know, obviously truth is a very uh, fluid thing, but it's, it's a pursuit that's worth it. So. Yeah, I have to follow up on that. Us at the Lantern, we're always worried. We always think about what's the new thing we can do with engagements. Always on the top of our mind. And like you said, this news media or the society itself has become partisan, and that's kind of a struggle that we've seen. Is there? Do you think there's an issue in objective news outlets like the Dispatch to kind of get that engagement because society may go to certain outlets for that partisan view or things like that? Well, um, I I, um, I might need you to. Um, explain a little bit what you mean by engagement. Yes. But um, we have great engagement with our content. Mm -hmm. last, last month, we had 104,000 uh, unique users on dispatch.com. Uh, now, this is a new thing as it relates to newsroom. We've got data. We've got dashboards. We've got statistics. We're, we're paying attention to how our content is engaged with, whether it's page views, whether it is they decided to get a subscription based upon the content or something like that. So we are watching engagement. We are paying attention to that. And we are driving some resources towards those topics and things that we know we get lots of engagement, because that indicates that there's great interest mm -hmm. in that topic in the community. Yeah, it was, yeah, awesome, thank you. Well, it was a kind of a great segue to you, Amelia, about um, opinion. Gannett um, has been shrinking its, its opinion news space, um, and I know that the dispatch is, is still one of the few that are clinging to providing opinion opportunities for people uh, in, in the chain. Um, I'm wondering kind of what your view is of this move to contract and, and in many cases eliminate the opinion version, uh, uh, opinion elements within the news frame, um, how you feel about that and kind of where you see the dispatch going with that in the future. 
I think a lot of that is a, a newspaper by a newspaper too. A lot of we do have a lot of uh, most of our newspapers, our larger newspapers, especially do to have vibrant opinion sessions. It's more like an evolution. Well, the, there was actually not to interrupt you, but there actually was a uh, there was an article in the oh. New York Times about how Gannett specifically was eliminating. At, uh, opinion and eliminating opinion pages. So I, I do think it's happening. Yeah, what more they than did was think. basically they stopped running it every day, but and I was going to get to that point right there. Basically, opinion is an evolution of a way we do opinion because opinion has um, been divisive the way we've done it. We've done it as an industry wrong in like in a way that uh, furthers the divide that we have in our country because it pits us against them too much, especially in some of the segments of. Uh, uh, some of the some of the uh, smaller communities we have, where it's basically like, this is my opportunity to yell at that other person. That's not serving democracy when you give people that um, platform. We have to be careful about what we allow out there, right? Um, so like, it's an evolution. Like old school editorial boards were very s seen anyway in the world as very stuffy and like I'm going to tell you what to do. That's not the approach I take. I allow people to present their points of view and have. Um, information is shared with the community that can perhaps further people's understanding and perhaps uh, further, uh, uh, you know, um, further accomplish the goals we all have, as, which is a better community. That's the evolution of the opinion section that I try, I'm trying to do right now, which is very complicated because some people don't like what I print or allow to be run in the paper, but I, that's, hey, I'm not here to reflect back to you exactly what you want to hear. I'm here to share opinions to further your understanding of other people in our community and what they might think of. Well, I so. think you know I'm going to ask you about this then. So oh, do the it. editorial that I heard about the most uh, was one from Donald Trump Jr., who was identified as, and I'm quoting, a businessman and author, and Donald Trump, uh, uh, businessman and author Donald John Trump Jr. is the eldest child of former President Donald Trump and the late Ivana Trump. And he wrote uh, an opinion piece that was run in the dispatch criticizing Tim uh, Ryan in his mm -hmm. uh, race against J.D. Vance. And I'm just curious, considering how limited and valuable opinion space has become, what is your thought process in running a column like that from someone who's outside of our community, who clearly has a strong bias and, and is, is not that I dispute anyone having an opposite viewpoint, but what did that contribute to the understanding of Columbus and the race that he was involving himself in? Well, you, you know, now where Donald Trump Jr., who, uh, whose father ran our country for, you can argue, half, still runs half our country, now you see where he thinks and what he's coming from and what the alternative is to what you're hearing. We can't just show one side, right? Uh, we also ran a, um, we also endorsed Tim Ryan in the race, right? Which no other, you know, well, one other newspaper in the, in the state did because we felt like Tim Ryan best expressed and um, championed the things that people in the community care about. I get, uh, the same week I got criticism over that, I also got death threats from <laughs> other people who were upset that I didn't push, uh, put uh, up a, a opinion piece that was uh, very transphobic. So we have these things, these conversations that we have about what to run, what to not run, why to run them, why not to run it. And it's not really true that the opinion space is shrunk. I run more opinion pieces online than I ever have. So uh, it's not really, Yes, we don't have as many days of the week in the print product, but we have more time to really cultivate these uh, opinion pieces that will better inform people's understanding of the world around them. So like, that's what I'm really striving to do. I, it's a complicated balance. Donald Trump's, um, Trump Jr.'s piece ran with an uh, editor's note that basically said, uh, wink, wink, this is not true. But it's important to still let people know what is being said. You know, it really is. You can't like just not, you can't ignore it because ignoring it is how we get into the situation where you only have one side of the conversation entering your ear. This is where you're talking about with people who only watch Fox News, who only watch CNN, so you don't see what the whole story is. Yeah. Um, I guess. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> um, what do you guys think the um, role of local news is in America today? Well, the role of local news is, once again, more critical than ever. Because if you think about it, in the past, there were multiple newspapers. In any community that you pick, there were multiple newspapers. So you think about the number of print, print newspapers that have uh, seen a demise. Um, and so you, you got to cherish, you got to hold on to local news. Uh, because the the bigger newspapers, the you know more regional newspapers, they're they're never going to cover a community to the depth 
that a local newspaper or a local news organization, I'll just say local, I, I love that term newspaper, but <laughs> a local news Don't organization <laughs> is going to cover it. So local news is so cr critical. Now, hey, you can get some local news by some emails. I'm not going to name them in the market. Uh, there, there, there is, there are some uh, nonprofit um, news organizations and other organizations that are trying to do hyper local news. Hyper local news. Some of that is done by journalists, and some of it isn't. It is neighbors, it is others coming together and sharing information about what's going on in your neighborhood. That could be considered local news. Now, we can't compete at that level at, in terms of specifically talking about all the specifics they're having and think about all the neighborhoods that are in, in uh, Columbus. But once again, local news is so critical. Yes, the New York Times will parachute in. Yes, you know, CNN or and a big story, they'll, they'll cover the school strike. They'll, they'll come in. You'll see them parachute in and then parachute out. But the local news organizations such as ours are there day in and day out, and that's why that is so critical. Well, I, I have to ask, since you made the, the note specifically between people who are journalists and people who are not, your background is primarily in PR, which in the, in the history of journalism and, and PR have been very separate and we haven't, we, we certainly don't operate in, in the same way. They're similar, but they're certainly not the same. So how does that influence your PR background, influence the way that you're leading the dispatch now? Well, uh, let's just make a correction. I have 27 years in newspapers. Now, so like, you uh, came most recently from PR, uh, exactly. and how long were you with PR? I was in PR for 10 years. Most recently? And, yes, okay. yes, exactly. My last, my, right before I came to the dispatch, I was with the Alzheimer's Association. But my background is in journalism and in print, and so the majority of my experience is in the news organizations. Now, I view this as an opportunity. I've been a news consumer for the last 10 years. I've not been in the industry, but I know the industry. I don't know from the back of my head. I mean, do it with my, ear, my eyes closed. I've been in the industry so long. But how I merged those two and brought those two together, I've been a reader. I've been a consumer. I'm, I, I bring that perspective. If anybody should care about local news, it should be I, because I grew up in, I grew up in the industry, yet, there were times when I was busy, didn't read the newspaper. There are times when I'm getting sources from all other things. And I was like, I need to go to, what is the dispatch? What's the Dayton Daily News? What's the New York Times? What is the Wall Street Journal? What are they saying about that? So, I, so my, my opportunity for coming back is I can bring that perspective into the newspaper. Okay, we know people are doing this. They're scanning to get information. Sometimes they just want enough to have a great conversation with somebody. People want to be informed. They want to have a conversation. They want to, oh, I got this and I want to share it. You know, that sort of thing. So that's, that is what it has informed and helped me as I'm coming back into the industry. I want you to know for somebody who grew up in the industry, here, I'm still acting like a consumer. So I, we, we, have to, we have to acknowledge we have to acknowledge the time mm -hmm. pressures. We have to acknowledge the great uh, cascade of information that is coming at everybody in all different ways, and we got to cut through that. We got to cut through that and create content that people care about, they want to know about, it makes them feel more informed, and all of that. So that's how I have utilized those 10 years um, and br brought that perspective back into the newsroom. But once again, most of my experience has been in journalism. So. Thank you. Um, where do you see the dispatch in 20 years and what kind of impact do you hope it has on the Columbus community? Man, if I, I, I think it's hard to kind of crystal ball 20 years from now, <laughs> my gosh. Uh, but I do know, I do know this and, and, I'm, and I'm hopeful of this, that we at the dispatch today will continue to do, I just had this conversation with our leadership. We will continue to put out the best uh, product that we can every day. We will, we will examine those issues. Don't, don't ever forget about the mission of why we're here and what we're trying to accomplish. Now all this other little stuff, whatever, that's not important. Every day there are thousands of people in this community that are depending on us, that w want to know what's going on. 
And we got to deliver that. So when I hope 20 years from now that we will continue to be doing that, that once again, we have changed how we deliver information, but the mission has not changed. The, the need for strong reporting, the need to look at records, the, the, all, of those, all of those basics and tenets of journalism are still there. And my hope is that 20 years from now, they will still be there because there will still be a need for the objective journalism and local news for a community. Awesome, thank you so much. Sure. Um, we'll move to questions from our live stream and in-person audiences in just a few minutes. Um, if you have a question, please make your way to the microphone now. Um, if you're watching online, please type your questions into the chat. Before we take audience questions, um, we have one more final question. So, you know, I, I think I, I look around the room. How many of you are, are newspaper readers? And, and I use the term newspapers specifically. Like you, you like newspapers, you, you like the touch of them, you feel of them. What? The print, you newspapers, that you like newspapers, you like that feeling. You know, we, it feels like we've lost something. I, you know, I, I, I don't get the dispatch delivered to my door anymore. I read it online. I even read the PDF version. But I, I do feel like the, this evolution has, has it's pulled us a little bit away from our community in the sense of we all once read the same thing. We all once had the same reference point in which we could pull information and what was important to our community. How can we stay in that same realm of staying in touch with what's important with our community when our news sources are so disparate, when we're, we're relying on social media and, and we're, we're listening to a multitude of different podcasts and a multitude of different apps and we're doing all these different pieces. How do we stay as one? Well, you know, um the, f the result of what you're talking about uh, is not being changed because of anything at the dispatch. It's being changed because society, uh, right. uh, the information sources are crazy. And I mean, that's, that's what's changed. What I, I guess what I'm trying to say and what I continue to say is the mission of what the dispatch does has not changed. Right. That has not changed. All the things that you're are absolutely correct, but that's because all these things, all a lot of other uh, opportunities to to read and gather information have have proliferated. It's, it's not because of changes at the dispatch. It's because of all this has happened. And and so um, once again, there is there there are other media in town that cover parts of. Um, parts of the community and you know everybody plays to their strengths you know radio has a strength tv has a strength mm -hmm. print has a strength the traditional print has a strength and i'm saying that that strength is still there and um it that if you if you want to know what's going on in columbus not just as a cursory 32nd level right. but you really want to know what's going on in this community what issues you should care about what's happening then then you there's, there's no, it's us. <laughs> it is us. It, it really is us. It us being in all different ways, not just print, but all different ways. We're your source. So. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists today. Um, I'm going to ask uh, some questions on behalf of uh, staff and the live stream audience, and then we'll alternate. Looks like we've got uh, lots of folks lined up here, but I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, this morning, um, uh, NPR ran an article on their website uh, with the following title. Uh, Donald Trump, who tried to overturns, overturn Biden's legitimate election, launches 2024 bid. So this uh, headline drew applause for its frankness um, from some online readers uh, for its frankness about the former president's actions, but others may see this as a headline that is taking sides. Um, in, from the perspective of American journalism, um, who is correct in that uh, observation? Well, let me just answer. The truth does not have sides. Okay, facts are facts. Some people consider uh, opinion facts, but facts are facts based upon our democratic process. Not facts based upon what the media says, it's facts based upon the, the democratic process. And not just in elected officials, but all, everything. It is the media, this is, this, is where, uh, this is where objective journalists come in. It is our responsibility to 
Mm, this, what, what did what did Amelia just say? That when she ran the column for Donald Trump Jr., she there was an editor's note there. So I, I'm I'm talking about objective facts that the majority can agree with, based upon democracy, based upon our democracy. So that's what I, that's how I would answer that question. Hi, I'm Trisha Strahler, and I am a proud graduate, as you are, of Ohio, from Ohio University with a degree Go in Bob public. Cats. <laughs> yeah, both of us. <laughs> well, both I, I, yes. my degree's in public relations, and I just want to set the record straight that there was very little um, educational emphasis put on public relations. When you got a degree in PR from OU, you got a degree in journalism, period. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I wanted to know, because journalism has evolved since those day when, days when Drew Everett, you know, grilled us with our ethics and that kind of thing, to being more entertainment oriented and um, people who aren't savvy to how journalism is reported can sometimes fall into the echo chamber and fall into the whole issue of, I mean, this all sort of went down the tube when news became entertainment instead of news. So what responsibility do journalists like yourselves have to educate, or and myself, to educate people to look for both sides? And what responsibilities do you have as sort of the last bastion for making sure that you are being impartial and you are being fair and you are representing both sides with no wink winks. Well, I will say this. I will say that in a lot of ways, journalism has failed America. Um, there is a reason that we're in the we're in the First Amendment because we're important to um, serve uh, democracy. And in a lot of ways, because of what you just said, we've uh, allowed it to be um, morphed into this entertainment, like this whole like you watch you watch election night. It's like a football game, basically. You're watching. It's like is my team up, and really uh, that's not what it should be about at all. So it's our responsibility to to do what we can to shift that individually. It might be hard in, in, industry wide. We have to have more of a push towards ethics and like what we actually stand for and how in the role we play in democracy. We can never let that um, slip from our minds. I, um, you know, I have taken a lot of punches for being a journalist, but I uh, truly will take them all because I believe the craft is so important, not just to um, the local community, but to the nation and to the future. I don't believe this, we are the last bastion of journalism. I think there's this girl, young lady right here, I just call you a girl, you're not a girl. Um, <laughs> it's proof that the future is sound because young folks wanna join this, uh, this um, this fraternity of journalists who are really out there seeking the truth. So um, we need to uh, deepen our connection to our community, make them know that we are citizens, not just these talking heads, these people who are gonna tell them what to do. We are part of the community, we care about the community, we are Americans. We are uh, Americans in the, the form that we will put our lives um, for the service of the truth. And that's a weird way to say it. I don't want anybody to think we wanna be shot or anything like that, that's weird. But we will stand up for democracy. So, I'm Carol Looper, a never retired journalist. I get the Columbus Dispatch hard copy every morning, have for more than 50 years, intend to continue. My reasoning is I want to support the reporters and the journalists because I do believe that they are the people who keep us in touch with the truth. But I have an editorial question. Number one, why are you only having the dispatch editorial page on a couple of days. And number two, in today's dispatch, there were three editorial comments, three letters to the editor, two of whom I recognized as regular contributors. How do people get their letters to the editor read and in the paper? Well, you, for the second part, you send it to letters uh, at dispatch.com. We look through all the letters we, we get and we choose the ones that are uh, rational um, to print. Some are irrational and we don't print those, as you can imagine. Um, the second part of your question is, that was a decision that was made um, Gannett-wide um, and we actually have more opinion days than a lot of newspapers. It's not just that um, they wanted to cut print days or anything like that, it was because we should be focusing on not just allowing like any old thing get in the paper. The best content should get in the paper. Um, and that's what 
uh, I try to do. Sometimes I do it well and sometimes I do not, but I try to do it every single day is to present the best content in the paper. And it really has freed me up to do some other things um, that are important, an uh, important part of my job as well. So it has its upsides and its downsides. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Mike Hochran with Mid-Ohio Food Collective. And first, a thank you to the dispatch and especially the opinion section for helping us keep the, the face of food insecurity in front of this community over the uh, difficult past year. Um, recently, Edwina, you were talking about journalistic responsibility. And I'm curious, as the sole remaining um, print newspaper circulator um, in our capital region and understanding Columbus as the sort of the growth engine of Ohio, what unique responsibilities does the dispatch have in terms of covering both actions at the State House and issues of statewide concern? And how effectively are we doing that today? Well, um, I'm pleased to say that Anthony Shoemaker, our, our editor over our political and, st and state house uh, coverage is here. And um, quite frankly, I think they do an excellent job of, of um, talking about the issues, talking about the upcoming legislation that people should pay attention to, talking, and I, I mean, I love their, yes, I'm giving you some, uh, some kudos public, but I love their coverage of the races you know, and help so you understand, um, you know, the candidates. Um, I think that we, and, and most of, if not all that they do, are from a statewide perspective, from a statewide perspective. So you get the context of the impact on the state. You know, during the election season, we talked about um, how Ohio has gone from a blue state to and people can either decide if it's, you think it's purple or if you think it's red right now. That, but um, explain how that happened, you know. Ex so I think that, um, and, I, and that um, most big papers still have some individuals that are covering the state house, but we have the most individuals that are covering the state house and state issues for the state. So. And two, what we try to do too is make it meaningful for the people who live in Columbus. Like, um, obviously, people think of the state house as the state house, right? But really, the state house affects us in cities and individuals and townships and everything else. So our goal is to make that real for people. Um, like the, the story we worked on with Mid-Ohio Food Collective was basically why do these decisions that are made by the governor impact local local families? It's because the government um, do, controls how this money is disseminated to um, to groups. So like we try to make it meaningful because otherwise it's just looking at like um, ordinances and not ordinances but acts and bills and acts and bills don't really mean anything unless you explain the significance um, of those bills and why they matter to real people. Hi, Lucia Lynches from Ion, Ohio. Um, obviously, you know, there's been sort of this big period of change, and I think one of the biggest things that I struggle with is, oh my gosh, there's so many stories that could be told and, you know, kind of limited funding to, to actually cover them. Um, you know, you talked about, um, Hey, you have a, a different, you know, vision for the future. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, maybe more specifically about, you know, what issues in the past do you feel like didn't get enough coverage and going forward, like what are the issues um, in the future that you'd really like to, to hone in on? Hmm. So um, my past is short lived. I've only been here about four months. so <laughs> I can't talk too much about the past, but um, I would, you know, once again, we are, looking at, we're, we're using research to look at what are, what are those topics that we need to be covering. Um, you know, when we look, you know, I'll, when we look at, um, you'll see growth possibly in um, crime storytelling. I mean, you, 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 see, you see that nationally, uh, true crime podcasts and Dateline NBC and <laughs> all those sorts of things. Um, how that uh, how that applies to cases in our area you'll see that um, you'll see uh, in terms of development i mean columbus is booming so the development what's happening business comings and goings what we need to know about where's where is the what's the next intel you know what's the impact on traffic what you know uh, we we've, we've been writing a lot about what's the impact oh, affordable housing how is this region going to solve that issue? So when I look at the future, you know, I'm, I'm looking at things like that that clearly will have an impact 
on the community. And, and two, I think, to just add on to that a little bit, I think there's certain communities who have felt a disconnect from the Columbus Dispatch, and I'm not you know, mitigating the past at all, because I think it's always been a fine newspaper, but we want to deepen our connections to the community at large and let people know that they do have a, a newspaper that cares about their concerns, a newspaper that is looking out for them and trying to protect not just um, their bottom line, but also their families and um, their their uh, their their uh, businesses. We're we're trying to be that newspaper, and I think um, Atwood has really kind of hit the run, ground running with that. So, yeah. thank you. Thank you again to our panelists. Uh, from the online audience, Chris Cloth says, "I love to hold the paper in my hands." Uh, that said, WOSU and NPR have become important sources of news for me. How do you see NPR influencing the role of print journalism locally and nationally? And I, I might add, how do you see, are there other national outlets that are influences for you? Um, I, don't, I don't really see NPR influencing anything that I do, anything that we do. Um, they, they have their lane <laughs> and they're great at it, quite frankly. Uh, as we are, <laughs> so um, I don't I don't see that influencing what we do at the local level. Um, I just I don't I don't see a relationship there, yeah, or impact I should say. Good afternoon. Um, thank you guys for being here. I'm Veronica Ferris and I'm with Mount Carmel Health System. Um, my question to the panel is really around, um, there's so many organizations competing for opportunities to get um, stories picked up and especially in healthcare. So how do organizations really stand out to you to be able to get picked up um, when we're pitching to you? Do you work in healthcare? I do. Well, I got a reporter for you right here. <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Um, obviously, as um, a, a Metro newspaper, we get lots of press releases. And um, we have um, multiple editors that are looking at those releases and um, trying to figure out which ones that we will write, uh, which ones have information that maybe fold into a bigger picture story or something like that. Um, I would always suggest that people continue to send us um, those releases, um, and but don't just don't just send us a release. Email our, all of our contact information is online, so you can email us. Um, you, our our telephone numbers I think are there. Um, you can call us. So um, that that personal contact as a follow up I think is really really important. Uh, when I was in PR, <laughs> going back to my PR days, I had to do that. And I know that that's really critically important because there's so many things that um, any staff of any news organization is doing that I, I just think that's important. Okay. And it's, it's also remembering that um, journalists are people. Like, we all get busy. We all have... Um, deadlines we have to meet, um, but it's also recognizing that the connection that you make as an individual and how to um, really kind of build that, uh, that long term is uh, key. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Well, we, I hope, oh, I was going to introduce you, Kirsten. So oh, there you go. Oh, no. You're so kind. Thank you. <laughs> I need another great introduction. <laughs> go right ahead. Well, actually, this will be a great opportunity uh, for me to thank you because uh, first, I hope everyone found today's forum not just interesting, but also valuable. So um, thank you to today's forum sponsors, the Ohio State University and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's forum, as well as the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream as well. So um, just so you know, we'll be taking a break next week for the Thanksgiving holiday, but we'll be back on November 30th for another forum. And that one is titled From Whitewater to mar -Lago, How High Profile Investigations Really work. So I would like to thank our uh, speakers today, Edwina Blackwell-Clark, Amelia Robinson, and our hosts, Nicole Kraft and Jessica Langer. Thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of your day.